The Lord be with you. Friends, I want to welcome you to the State of Christ Presbyterian Church, and we are so glad you're here with us today. And uh, it's just, uh, I, I, love listening to the, I love listening to the congregation before we get ready for worship, the friendship and the fellowship uh, that we share in Christ. You know, yesterday we were driving home from uh, uh, an event at a church member's home, and Faith and I, we were talking along the drive, and we were saying, you know, just how blessed we feel to be among a fellowship of people who are so loving and so kind. And you can't take that for granted. And I hope that you will always look for opportunities to share fellowship with one another, to rejoice in one another's gifts and, and what God has given, because God has done something very special uh, in this place and for us, and we give him the glory. I want to welcome you, and if you're visiting today, I want to extend a special welcome. Special welcome to Eileen and Farley's family today visiting for us. We're glad to have you folks here with us, and uh, pray God's blessings upon everybody who is visiting. Uh, very quickly to go through some announcements today, uh, I want to point your attention to the Rose in the Sanctuary. Uh, had a little uh, a little boy born this week, Andrew James Javorski, uh, was born, yay, you know, and uh, uh, I think I like I like to joke with Buck when I first met them, they had no grandchildren, now you're up to how many, seven? Seven grandchildren. Keep it up. All right. So uh, uh, we just want to share that. Also to share with you that today, and it's only, uh, like they say, a limited three-week engagement, uh, Dr. Tim Burberry began a Sunday school on the screw tape letters. Fantastic, fantastic book, fantastic um, uh, study, Bible study, Sunday school. Uh, Tim, thank you for teaching it. And this is in preparation uh, for our upcoming Memorial Day weekend retreat, which is... Um, uh, you can see in, in your bulletin there, uh, putting on the full armor of God. And uh, we see some of the uh, 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 props up here with this. Jane Nicholas um, is a genius. I can just say that, the way she does this. She is organizing the retreat, the theme of the retreat. She goes as far as to even make sure the shielding is authentic to what we're doing for the time. And so you can see information in your bulletin about that. It's going to be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Friday at Barbersville, Saturday at... Uh, Ritter Park and Sunday back at Barbersville for worship and there's information in the bulletin including uh, t-shirt sizes would really love for you to be able to mark your sh sizes and get those in so we can get them ordered for you and 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 they're free of charge and it's, a, it's just a great way to spend some time uh, with your church family uh, during that weekend uh, also as as again getting back to the class um, I think we're almost out of books we want to give a, a copy of the screw tape letters to every family in the church. There might be one or two left. If you did not get one or, they, or we have run out, please let me know. We will get you a copy. Uh, this is just a great study to prepare us for that and, and a great study in general. And if you haven't yet, please mark uh, on the sheets there so we know who's gotten them and then we can mail to anybody who has not gotten them. Uh, also want to share with you uh, upcoming, our journey through the Bible, uh, Bible study is this Tuesday at 11 o'clock. Uh, Sarah Lance, Sarah, raise your hand. Sarah teaches that. And if you've never come before, uh, I'd like to have you come and try it out for the first time. So it's a, it's a great way to just uh, get into that study. And uh, you can ask Sarah any questions about that. And also just some uh, information about a new members class. I've had a lot of people asking about a new members class. Let me know if you're interested. I'm finishing up a confirmation class. As soon as we get that done, we will look to uh, begin a brief new members class for anyone who's exploring it. And uh, if you come to it, that doesn't mean you're committed to joining. You may just want to find out a little bit more about the church and, and how we operate. Uh, a couple of other things I want to share with you for uh, prayer. Just want to keep in special prayer. Uh, Caden Hess uh, in the hospital. He should be being discharged today, but please keep Caden and his family in your prayers. As, as well as Clayton Cremines, who is Aaron Lowry Cremines' uh, father-in-law. Uh, he is uh, not in good health right now. And then a very special thing, and I'd like us to take a moment to pray about this now. Um, is that I was coming out of Cabell Huntington Hospital yesterday and a man got on the elevator with me and he started telling me he's, his granddaughter, two years old, is in intensive care there uh, in a very serious condition. And I don't know if this was in the newspaper or not, but apparently her mother's boyfriend had shaken her really badly. And was that in the paper? I, I, I must have missed, pardon? They're from Ashland, okay. Um, the way he talked about it, it almost sounded like this is something that was in the news, and he was just asking prayer. Her name is Callie. She's a little two-year-old girl, and I said, 
I will pray for you. And I said, we will pray for you at church tomorrow. So can we just bow our heads for a moment of prayer? Father, we do thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ, your grace and your love for us, Lord, and how Jesus is our great physician. And Lord, right now, that little girl, Callie, Lord, we lift her up in prayer, her and her family, Lord, for her recovery, for her healing, for her strength, Lord. Give her family hope, Lord, and, and just, Lord, for that, uh, for that grandpa I met in the elevator yesterday, Lord. Thank you for him sharing that, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, your healing hand would be upon her and her family. And we thank you, Lord, now you're the God of all hope. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite Jennifer Perry forward. She has a minute for mission for Cure Search. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I have the privilege in just over a month to participate in a 21 mile hike in Canaan Valley. And I work with teenagers all the time, and I'm a huge fan of reframing because. Some people would say, you get the privilege to do that? You mean you have to? No, I'm fortunate that I can do this. And um, this, this has touched me because um, I work with children. And like Pastor John just spoke about, anytime that we have a child who is suffering from, from an injury, an illness, um, we're, we're touched so deeply. Um, Anytime anyone is ill, we feel for them, but when it's children who are suffering, uh, we have a, a special place for that. So I have the opportunity to participate in what's called the Ultimate Challenge Hike, and it is for um, Cure Search, which is a national nonprofit for uh, children's cancer. And they, they fund research and they support families who are going through treatment. And the reason why this really touched me this year is because one of my friends from high school, her son was diagnosed with a very rare form of cancer called Lodge, Hodgkin's lymphoma, lymphocyte predominant, which affects an incredibly small portion of the, um, of the population. And they didn't know a whole lot about it. He had to go undergo uh, treatment that they didn't know whether it would work, how effective it would be. And um, this kid has fought valiantly. He is in remission right now and um, just really touched a part of me that I we're the, in the same class at school and I thought this could be my child. So as I was thinking on that, this opportunity came to me. And to participate in this hike, I need to raise $2,400 um, by the time the hike happens. So far, I'm about $800 in. So I ask you to prayerfully consider supporting this hike. If, of course, it's, it is, um, you know, you can take this off of your taxes, but I, I ask you to think about what if it was someone in your life that was affected by this? Would you want others rallying with you? And just like with little Callie, I know that you would. So please prayerfully consider that. You can um, look in your bulletin as for details on how you can support that. But um, I also ask you to pray for me as I undertake this, that 21 miles is long, a long journey on one's feet. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, we can look in the bulletin newsletters for that or just uh, contact Jennifer or contact myself or the church office and we'll make sure we get you uh, all put together. I want to invite you to stand now for our call to worship taken from the book of Revelation, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. As the revelation comes to a close, this is the promise we have. The Lord says, behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Friends, our first hymn this morning is 10,000 Reasons. Let's praise God together. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. 
my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing the song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. And on the day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. I worship Your holy name. Lord, I worship Your holy name. Thank you. Please be seated. As we've been learning from David, we are all sinners. We're no better or worse than anyone else. Yet he knew, David knew that God would forgive him of those sins. And all he had to do was confess them, as we do now. In Psalms 38, 18, the psalmist says, I confess my iniquity. I am troubled by my sin." In like manner, we should all be troubled by our sin when we drift away from God. Let us now go before God's holy throne, first silently, then in unison, as we confess and seek God's forgiveness for our sins. Let us pray. And now let us join together. Heavenly Father, you lift us up when we're down. You reassure us when we're afraid. And you comfort us when we're distressed. Your mercy is unending. We confess that we don't deserve all the goodness that is shown to us, but are slowly learning your grace doesn't rest on our worthiness but on your character of compassion and love. In Jesus Christ, your compassion and love were on full display as he took up the cross to atone for our sins and bring us back into fellowship with you. For by his life, death, and resurrection, he became the way of salvation and calls us now to trust in him. So whenever we're down, Whenever we're afraid or distressed or not living into the truth of who we are as your sons and daughters, 
Remind us again of Jesus, who is the embodiment of your love and our new redeeming hope. Fill us again with the Holy Spirit that our lives may reflect the the truth and be guided by the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. In the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 31 through 36, we are told, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Please rise. Oh Lord my God, I pray. Your name is over every other. You are the way, the truth, and the life, and you shall reign forever. And now that we have gone before God to confess our sins and ask forgiveness of them and declare that God has pardoned us for our sins, we have received a new peace in our souls. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, we are told, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you. Please share the peace of Christ with one another as our children come forward. Good morning. How are you guys? <laughs> Today we're going to talk a little bit about the disciple Peter. Now, um, what can you tell me about Peter? Do you remember what he did for work? What kind of what did what do you remember about him? 
He was a fisherman. Do you remember that? And what kind of special things did Peter do in the Bible? In Matthew 9, oh, sorry, Matthew 14, he walked on water. Remember that part? That was cool. Um, in Luke 9, he witnessed Jesus' transfiguration, and he was in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus also. So we know that Jesus, um, Peter, was a very faithful follower of Jesus, but he also was far from being perfect. So do you remember before the crucifixion when Peter denied that he even knew Jesus three times? This was even after Jesus said that he was going to do it. Why do you think he did that? Maybe it was because he was afraid or because he was nervous. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever said or done something that you weren't proud of because you were afraid of being caught or nervous? In John 21, 15 to 25, we learn that even though Peter made that mistake, Jesus still forgave him and washed the sin away. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus told Peter, feed my lambs. Jesus asked him again, asked him a total of three times for each of the times that he had denied him. Jesus also washes away our sins, just like he did with Peter. We make so many mistakes, but... We know that God offers us a new beginning every time we ask for forgiveness. Will you pray with me? Dear Jesus, we are sorry when we don't always do the, the right things. Guide us in making good choices. And thank you for loving us and helping us become more like you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. I'd like to thank Farley and Eileen for the children's message again, sharing God's word with us. Um, during the announcements, there was one announcement I forgot to share. We want to um, extend special congratulations to Spencer Atkins, who was named the West Virginia Weather Broadcaster of the Year. So, uh, <laughs> it's it's good to have friends in high places. We have had things where where, where we've had church events that we're going to be outside and, and kind of have direct access to Spencer. I'll text him and I'll say, what do you think? And he'll give me the expert opinion. We, we share your joy. And uh, Susan, you are a blessed and lucky woman. So, okay. You know, we, uh, Tim Burberry mentioned last week that we are still in the season of Easter and and that is true. And one of the things I want to talk about today is uh, what do we do with this message of Easter? What do we do with this message that Jesus Christ is risen? And what does it mean for our lives? Because it's got to mean something. Our faith can never just be an academic pursuit, something that's up here that doesn't have any uh, effect on our lives. It, Jesus' resurrection, it calls us to something. It calls us to uh, a particular way of life, a particular way that God has uh, charted out for each one of us individually as well as corporately. And today in the scripture lesson, we're going to see what that means for Peter and for us as well. I was thinking about this. Uh, when I was younger, when I was in high school, uh, I, I ran track and field. Now I have to, uh, I always liked sharing my athletic exploits. You know, when I did that in the previous church I served, I always got away with it because I was probably, you know, I probably could get away with it there. But in this congregation, we have fantastic athletes uh, and I always feel a little bit ashamed sharing my exploits because I know some of the people here are record setters, college, you know, record setters, things like this. But at least in high school, um, I, uh, I played soccer, ran track. And even though I went to college to play soccer, uh, I actually lettered in track first. So I was actually probably a better track uh, runner than I was a soccer player. But I had a problem when it came to track and field. Uh, I couldn't settle down and follow my own path. Uh, I was probably built for running. I was really small and thin, never got tired and could run like the wind. Uh, even now, if you read my newsletter article where my doctor told me I've never been heavier, you know, I still run. I mean, I'm, you know, I've run all my life. 
but I never could pin that down. I always wanted to do what everybody else was doing. So if somebody long jump, I wanted to try that, and I, and I did that. Scored a few points doing that. Uh, if someone high jumped, I mean, I am five foot eight with a big Irish head. I got no business high jumping, <laughs> but I high jumped. Um, I pole vaulted. Uh, I actually did have modest success in that. Um, I even tried throwing the discus. I mean, I was all of 120, 130 pounds, and I'm fooling around with the discus. And you know, and as, as a result of this, I probably never became the runner I could have become because I could run, you know, I could run. And, and something's true like that spiritually. Uh, sometimes we forget that, you know, not all gifts are ours or not all paths are ours, but God has given us a path. And sometimes we get distracted from that calling when we focus so much on everybody else, you know. So I look over and they say, hey, those, those distance guys, they, they look like they're having fun. Maybe I should try that. Or those low jumpers, they look like it's a great, maybe I should do that instead of doing what maybe God has called or gifted me to do. We're going to see that today in the gospel lesson from John as it refers to Peter. Now, a uh, little background in the uh, gospel lesson. This is John chapter 21, final chapter in John's gospel. And, and it's really fascinating because if you read at the end of chapter 20, it looks like John is coming in for a landing. Like this is where he's going to end the gospel. For Let me just share that with you. At the end of chapter 20, John says, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So it sounds like this is where John probably figured he was going to end his gospel. But I think, you know, through the inspiration of the Spirit, he says, wait, there's one more thing we got to share. And it's about a post-resurrection appearance of Jesus. The disciples, led by Peter, uh, seven of them, uh, they go out fishing one night. And I am sure that in the days after the resurrection, everything is so confused. They don't know what's going on. They don't know how to react, which way to turn. And remember, they will not know this until the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes and actually fills them with the ability to understand. But so they go out fishing, and they catch nothing that morning. Jesus is actually on the beach, and he calls to them. They don't recognize him at first, but then they do. And, and they have this kind of reunion and this, this meal together on the beach. Um, and John says this is the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he had risen from the dead. Right after that then comes the passage we're going to look at where uh, several things are happening. Jesus restores Peter. You know, Peter is, as Farley Eileen had said, Peter had denied Jesus three times. Jesus goes through this, what, what to Peter will be kind of a painful process of, of restoring him to fellowship and ministry and calling. And Jesus says, follow me. And no sooner does Jesus say, follow me to Peter, than Peter starts looking around and says, yeah, Lord, but what about him? What about him? Already, he's losing focus. And essentially, Jesus says, he doesn't say it in these words, but this way, he says, Peter, mind your own business. Mind your own business. And Jesus is kind of stern here, mind your own business. I've got a plan for him. I've got a plan for you. And likewise, God has a plan for each and every one of us. And the beautiful part is that, you know, I'm 55 years old now, so I've got a little bit of, you know, I've got a little bit of mileage under my belt here. And uh, it's great to see, look back and see where that plan has led you, but also know God's got still so much more for each of us and this plan in our lives. So we're going to pick this up here in verse 15. Again, it's the time on the beach. They have had fellowship together, and now Jesus brings Peter aside and begins to restore him. And so we're looking at verses 15 through 25. Friends, hear the word of the Lord. The scripture says, when they were finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death 
by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the same one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for your holy word, the living word, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray now, Lord, the words of my mouth and meditations of all our hearts would be pure and acceptable in your sight, our Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' holy name, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Well, um, what do you think they would have looked like? And quite simply, would they have been as good? Now by they, they, I mean your favorite movies and TV shows. What would they have been like with perhaps different actors or actresses playing the lead roles? You know, someone different from the ones you know. For example, I saw the Avengers movie earlier this week. Anybody see Avengers? Let me see Avengers. You know, I love that stuff. Superheroes and all that stuff. But I will tell you, uh, I won't spoil it, but there will come a time down the road. There was a profound, a couple of profound, but a profound theological insight uh, to this later Avengers movie. And when, it, when enough time has gone by, I'll share that with you because I don't want to give, give away any of the endings. But, but, but I love Avengers. And you may have heard that Avengers is on its way to possibly being the highest grossing film of all time. Two billion dollars in two weekends. It's already made that, and and it's just just you know a great series. And and my favorite Avenger is Iron Man, Tony Stark, sort of the cornerstone for the whole thing. In fact, the original Iron Man kicked off this whole series way back in two thousand eight. And 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 Iron Man is just cool. He's 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 powerful. He's he's a good guy. He's he, you know always looking for the greater good. But um, you know I was thinking. What, what if somebody other than Robert Downey Jr. had been picked to play Iron Man? Uh, what if it had been somebody else in the lead role? Would it have been as good? You know, you may not know, but there, have been, there were other actors actually considered for this. People were really pushing. For example, Tom Cruise. They wanted Tom Cruise to be Iron Man or Hugh Jackman and even Nicolas Cage. Now, they're all great actors in their own right, but, but I wonder, could they have pulled off Iron Man? with the same irreverent genius the way Robert Downey Jr. did. You know, uh, kind of a coincidental, although don't believe in coincidence in the kingdom of God. Last night I was flipping through the TV, Raiders of the Lost Ark was on. Now, Harrison Ford, of course, of Han Solo, uh, Indiana Jones, he, he kind of made that role famous. But did you know that it actually came down, it was almost 50-50 between uh, Harrison Ford and Tom Selleck. Remember Tom Selleck from Magnum P.I.? You know, he, he might have been okay in that role. Or another one. Will Smith was almost cast as the role of Neo in The Matrix instead of Canal Reeves. And I thought that might have been an interesting choice. Now, sometimes it, uh, for actors, it doesn't work out. John Travolta actually turned down the opportunity to play Forrest Gump. And, of course, that became a huge hit, and it won Tom Hanks an Oscar. And Holly Berry, she declined the lead role in the movie Speed, which helped make Sandra Bullock a star. I mean, could you imagine... Any of these other actors or actresses in these roles? Maybe a few. But, you know, some of these roles just, just seem like they were made for the people who played them. For example, Judy Garland in The Wizard of Oz. Even though a lot of people were lobbying for in, who they wanted to play it, Shirley Temple instead. Or Al Pacino. Maybe, you know, in my opinion, it's violent and it's gory and everything. My, my opinion, greatest 
movie series of all time, The Godfather Chronicles there, Al Pacino in the role of Michael Corleone, the part was actually first offered to Jack Nicholson. But Nicholson thought that he was too old for the part and he turned it down. And did you know that the role of George Costanza on Seinfeld, anybody have any idea who it was offered to first? Actually offered to David Letterman band leader Paul Schaefer. You know who Paul Schaefer is? True story. You can look it up on YouTube. Schaefer tells the story. He got a message. He said that Jerry Seinfeld, who was you know, a stand-up comedian at the time, that he was starting his own TV show and that they wanted Schaefer to play the part of Costanza, that he didn't even have to audition. And what was Paul Schaefer's response? He said, Jerry Seinfeld, what kind of show could he possibly get? So the part went to actor Jason Alexander instead, which turned out great because I can't imagine anybody else playing the role of George Costanza. Can you? He's made for that role. Well, you know, we don't know how it would have worked out had any of these other actors played these roles instead, but we do know this. We know that when God casts you and I, when he casts us in a particular role, God always gets it right because the roles God calls us to are always perfectly designed for us so that we can live out our calling in the best way possible as Jesus' disciples. Now, uh, as I said before, um, Tim Burberry last week mentioned we're still in the season of Easter, and, uh, and I'm glad he did because it's a reminder that Easter isn't just a day. In the church, Easter is actually a season. It culminates in, on the day of Pentecost 50 days later. Uh, but even beyond that, and, and we have to be clear about this, Easter is a way of life. It's how we as Christians respond to the good news of Jesus' resurrection, it's, it's really the grand truth by which we order our lives, or at least it should be. And in today's scripture lesson, taken from this final chapter in John's Gospel, we find Peter wrestling with that grand truth and how that truth teaches us that each of us have a unique calling and unique role to play in God's kingdom, a role that's unlike anybody else's. And so this final story at the end of the Gospel, it really serves two purposes. On, on the one hand, and we mentioned it, it involves, uh, or rather resolves, Peter's uh, failure and his guilt uh, for denying Jesus on the night of his betrayal and arrest. Uh, there on the beach, Jesus forgives Peter, and he renews his sense of calling, and he recommissions him to service. Uh, but on the other hand, and this is what we want to focus on today, no sooner does Jesus forgive Peter and recommission him than Peter's focus begins to wander, and he starts wondering about the Lord's plans for somebody else. In fact, right after Jesus calls Peter to follow him again, this is what the scripture says. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved, meaning John, that he was following them. And when Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? What about him? You know, isn't that the way it always is? Jesus makes it really simple. You follow me. And we go and complicate things all the time. Okay, Lord, I'll do that. But what about him? What, what about her? As Curtis Andresco of the Summit Church says, you know, no matter where we are in life, we are always, always looking around and comparing and thinking things like, you know, why don't I have as much as they have? Why isn't my spouse as attentive as theirs? Why isn't my job as fulfilling? How come I don't have the kind of family they have? Compare, compare, compare. Now, I remember when my kids were younger, I uh, told one of them once that I wanted them to do something. It wasn't real big, just, you know, something I wanted them to do. And, of course, in a family with multiple siblings, you probably know where this is going, the reply came back, well, yeah, but what about so-and-so, right? Anybody been there? Okay. Yeah, a lot of you. And, and the implication is, it was that unless I was asking their siblings to do the same exact thing, that somehow I wasn't treating them fairly. You, you know what I mean? And I knew this was going on, so, so I wanted to get to the root of it. And I asked this particular child of mine, who I won't identify, I asked them this. I said, do you trust me? They said, of course, yeah, I trust you. They said they did. And then I said, well, if you trust me, please trust that there was a reason that I'm asking you to do this instead of so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And I said, do you understand that? And they said they did. So I repeated my initial request. And then after having gotten done saying all that, that they trusted me, they said, yeah, but if you just tell me why. We see the issue isn't really in the why. 
The issue is all about the way we compare ourselves to others. And we do it all the time. We even do it in the church. Even ministers, we're supposed to know better. We do that. You know the way ministers compare themselves to one another? Do you know how they compare? It's by the three Bs. You ever hear the three Bs? You know what they are? They're budgets, buildings, and butts. Budgets, buildings, and butts. How big's your budget, how nice is your building, and how many people you got sitting in the pews on Sundays. That's how ministers do it all the time. It's, it's disgusting, but we do it. But that's, how we're, that's how we're tempted to evaluate our worth. But the problem is with comparing ourselves to one another is that it takes our focus off of what God is doing in our own lives and the unique way in which he's called each and every one of us. You know, years ago, I remember having a conversation with a woman about her relationship with God. It's actually a relative of mine. And at some point in the conversation, she changed the uh, topic from her own relationship with Christ to what God is going to do about, you know, people in other parts of the world who may have never heard of Jesus Christ. You know, there's always, you know, the, you know an orphan in Tibet who's never, who's never heard of Christ. Was he going to save them too? And, and it's an interesting question, of course. And we could spend hours debating that question, talking about it. Although in the end, uh, remember, it still comes down to the Great Commission. Jesus doesn't tell us to answer those questions. He just tells us to go and share the gospel, make disciples of all nations. Uh, but in my conversation with this woman in the context, you know, what she was really trying to do when she brought that up is she was trying to, she was trying to change, change the topic. She was trying to divert attention away from herself. She, as long as we can keep the question uh, focused on what is God doing with others, she didn't have to deal with the question of what is God doing with her. How's God calling her in her own life? It reminds me of how Jesus touched a nerve in his encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well. Do you remember the story? You know, they, Jesus meets this woman at the well, and pretty soon the conversation starts to hit too close to home, and, and this reality of her string of failed marriages comes up, and, and suddenly she doesn't want to talk about her own life anymore. And she doesn't want to talk about the gift of living water Jesus promises. So she changes the subject and tries getting Jesus into a debate about where the best place to go to church was. And we do it all the time. And Peter's doing it here too. I mean, you know, we, we, we got to understand what's going on here. Peter, Peter's glad to be forgiven. He's, he's overjoyed. He has failed miserably and now he's given a second chance. And God is the God of second chances. But as soon as the conversation starts to get uncomfortable, and Jesus talks about one day be, Peter being led to a place he doesn't want to go, an indication, John tells us, about the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And we know Peter was crucified in Rome, and when he was uh, brought to the cross, he asked to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy to die in the same manner as the Lord. But he doesn't know that then, but at this point, he looks to deflect attention from where God is calling him in his own life to what God's plans for his buddy John may be. But the point is, it's never what God is doing with somebody else. The point is always, what is God doing with you and with your unique call in your life? Again, it, we resist it because it goes back to the idea of comparison. Are, are we being treated fairly? Is, is somebody maybe getting a better deal than me? But listen, we've got to be real careful about demanding fairness from God. You know, one of the sobering truths uh, we have to realize is that God is never fair with us. He is never fair. And as strange as that sounds, that's actually a good thing. You see, fairness would demand that Jesus completely write Peter off for the miserable failure he's been. Fairness would hold Peter accountable for every mistake he ever made and would reckon the enormity of all his sins squarely back on his own shoulders, burdening him with a debt to God that he could never repay. That's what fairness would be, not only for Peter now, but for you and me as well. But God doesn't deal with us in terms of fairness. God deals with us by grace, always giving us what we don't deserve and then calling us to follow the unique plan he's laid out for each of our own lives, regardless of the plans he's laid out for anybody else. 
You know, the first house that Faith and I lived in together as a, as a married couple was an old church parsonage uh, in Pennsylvania. You call them parsonages or manses. Um, used to be more common that when a pastor served a church, the church had a, a place where they would live. And uh, we had just gotten out of seminary. Uh, and part of my call there as pastor was getting to live in the house rent-free, which was great since we were young and we didn't have any money to buy our own house anyway. And the house itself, you know, this is a small little town in Pennsylvania, in you know, Amish country. It wasn't, wasn't anything fancy, but the church did a really nice job of fixing up for us before we arrived. Uh, this house had a large country kitchen uh, with knotty pine cabinets, you know, the kind of big enough kitchen kind of place you could entertain a lot of people there. There was a, a nice sized living room. It was perfect for just hanging out or hosting church groups. And, and I had a little study uh, toward the back of the house that was, was really nice, kind of isolated, and there was a little deck outside off of the door uh, in my study. Uh, they even put a new bathroom in for us, and some of the ladies, I still remember, Norma Jean Welfley, she, uh, uh, she, this older woman, she was climbing a ladder, helping Faith wallpaper the house. Uh, it wasn't the Taj Mahal, but, you know, it was nice. It was nice, right? And, and we, we were happy. We were happy. And then, then I went to a visit a friend one day in Virginia. He's a pastor, too. And the church home he was living in was more contemporary. They had new carpeting. We didn't have new carpeting. They had a lot more living space. In fact, everything about his house was just a little bit newer and a little bit nicer than mine. And you know what I was thinking then, right? Suddenly, I wasn't quite as happy with a my own house as I had been before. Now, mind you, nothing had changed. Nothing except my perceptions. My preoccupation with what the Lord had given my friend distracted me from what the Lord had given me, and this is exactly Peter's problem. See, the minute he looks over his shoulder and he sees his buddy John following, he immediately loses focus on God's unique call in his life, and he begins wondering what God's got in mind for John, and God's got plans for John for sure but his plans and purpose for somebody else is never the point. The point is always, where is God calling you? Where is he calling me? What unique gifts has he given all of us? And in what special places has he put each of us to accomplish his will? This is what Jesus says to Peter when Peter asks about John. The Lord tells him, I mean, kind of, you know, uh, summing it up rather bluntly. He says, Pete, mind your own business. Just mind your own business. You follow me. It reminds me of a story uh, I read of a man walking down a road one day. In a, it was the road he was walking down was adjacent to a mental hospital. Uh, the hospital compound actually had a very tall fence separating it from the road. And the man says, he says, I, I could hear shouting coming from the other side of the fence as I walked along. And he said, all the patients were shouting, 13, 13, 13, over and over and over again. And the man says, I was intrigued. So as I walked along, I saw a little tiny hole in the fence. And, and even though I felt silly, I decided to peek through and see what was going on inside. So he says, I pressed my eye up against the fence. And as soon as I did, someone from the other side poked it with a stick. And all the patients started shouting, 14, 14, 14. <laughs> and he says, that's how I learned to mind my own business. Well, you know, you know it's not always a matter of getting poked in the eye. But it is about finding fulfillment, and it is about finding contentment of knowing that we are following God's will for our own lives, regardless of his will for anybody else. As the Bible teacher John Piper suggests, he says, Jesus' words about minding your own business, he said, they're actually very liberating words, and they are. They free us from this depressing bondage of fatal comparison. But I want to go a step further than Piper. I want to say the real key is actually knowing, uh, is actually... Uh, I'm sorry, the real key is you actually stop comparing. You actually stop doing that comparison when you know you're loved. When you know you're loved, that's when the comparisons stop. And of course, this is the whole point of Jesus' death and resurrection. You see, when Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the tomb three days later, we not only saw the power of God at work, we saw the love of God at work as well. That he would go through all of that even when they didn't have to for us, for you, and for me. And when you know you're loved like that, 
when you know someone would go that far for you, when you know you're truly loved to the depth of your being, it sets you free. Free to be the person God uniquely created you to be. Free to follow wherever he's called. And free to love others the way he's loved you. As I said in our announcements this morning, um, we began a, a short three-week series on C.S. Lewis's book, The Screwtape Letters, today. And I want to thank um, Elder Tim Burberry. He is our resident C.S. Lewis scholar. Great class and invite you to come for the next two weeks. Um, Lewis, as he said, how many books did he write, Tim? He said about 80? 30 plus. Oh, 30 plus, 30 plus. Um, and uh, one of his books in the Chronicles of Narnia series is called The Horse and His Boy. And, and in that book, there's a young man named Shasta who tries to escape a life of slavery by fleeing to Narnia. And, and along the way... Uh, Shasta meets a young girl named uh, Erebus who's fleeing to Narnia as well. And they travel together, and during their travels, they have several dangerous encounters, some with lions, and including one in which Erebus uh, is wounded uh, by one of these lions. Uh, but later on, Shasta learns that all the lions they think they've met along the way, and there have been quite a few of them, all of them have actually been the same lion. It's been one single solitary lion who's Aslan, the great lion of Narnia. And uh, if you know Lewis's works in his mythology, Aslan is the Christ figure in the Narnia series. He's, he's symbolic for Jesus. And as Aslan talks with Shasta, he reveals uh, lots of things, how he's been with Shasta all the way, even during the most difficult times of his life and the painful times. In fact, Aslan says it was often through these difficulties where he was most often at work in Shasta's life. And so Shasta, the wheels start turning, and he says, then, then it was you, it was you who wounded Erebus, he says, thinking back to one of their encounters on the way where she was injured. And Aslan replies, it was I. But what for, Shasta asks, to which Aslan replies, child, I am telling you your story, not hers. I tell no one any story but their own. You know, there's a lot of wisdom there because we've all got our own stories too. And the only story we're accountable for the end is our own story. Regardless of what God is doing in anybody else's life, each of us has to make their own decision to follow Jesus Christ and to be open where Jesus calls us and how he wants to use us. A friend of mine said, when God handcrafted you, you, he did so with a unique purpose in mind, and your purpose is unlike anybody else's purpose. And it's this purpose, this calling, whatever it is that God's created you for, this is yours alone to follow. You know, I like the story of a city guy. Um, he got his car stuck in a uh, ditch one day in the country. Fortunately for him, a local farmer happened to be going by with a big old plow horse and a wagon, and old horse named Buddy, and so the farmer kindly offered to help the guy out of the ditch, and he hitched old buddy to the car. As soon as they had everything secure, the farmer walked around to the front of the horse, and he walked around to Buddy, and he said, pull, Nelly, pull! And uh, Buddy didn't move. Then the farmer walked around the other side of the horse and hollered, pull, spirit, pull! But again, Buddy, buddy just stood there, didn't even flinch. Once more, he commanded, pull, Coco, pull! Uh, but again, Buddy didn't move at all. And finally, the farmer just kind of said very quietly, pull, Buddy, pull. And with one quick tug, old Buddy easily dragged the car out of the muddy ditch, and everything was good. Well, city slicker, he was pretty grateful, but he was a little curious, too. And so he asked the farmer why he called his horse the wrong name three separate times. Well, see, it's like this, the farmer replied. Old buddy here is blind, and if he thought he was the only one pulling, he wouldn't even try. <laughs> well, you know, we could say, we could say that we've, we've got our own load in life to pull, and, and that, that's true. But the truth is, the gospel shows us that we're never really pulling that load alone. That Jesus promises to be with us wherever he calls us, and the fact is, as he's already shown us, Jesus Christ does the heavy lifting just like he did on the cross. So our job, if you could even call it that, rather our privilege, our privilege is to simply listen for that calling and then follow the plan he's laid out for each one of our lives. Because you know the truth is that God is never more glorified 
and that we are never more truly ourselves than when we are living out the unique calling and purpose he's designed for each of us, whatever that calling and purpose might be. Would you pray with me? Father God, we're so thankful for Jesus, your son, Lord, who calls us to follow, who did the heavy lifting, Lord, and invites us now to follow in a life of discipleship. Lord, the beautiful thing, even in this place, Lord, as we think about our brothers and sisters around us, Lord, that you've gifted us all so many different ways, Lord, and, and that's wonderful. And Lord, what's even more freeing and wonderful and liberating is that we don't have to have the same gifts as somebody else. We don't have to follow uh, the same course, Lord, in, in the path of discipleship you've called us. Your word tells us, Lord, you've given this gift to one, this gift to others, Lord. Some you call, uh, Lord, to places far away. Some, Lord, you call to places real close. Some, Lord, you call to ministry up front and center. Some you call to quiet ministries, Lord, that nobody else ever sees. But, Lord, you call each of us, and we thank you for that. And we pray, Lord, by your spirit that we would be encouraged, Lord, and mindful and aware of where you've called us, how you've equipped us, Lord, and our part in your kingdom. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for doing that to give us a place in your kingdom, in your Father's house, and we give you the glory today. Lord, we lift up our church, Lord, that we may be a community of faith, Lord, that lives the truth of the gospel, uh, the love and truth of the gospel, Lord. And we pray to be a, community, uh, a church community that makes an impact on our entire community. Lord, we lift up little Callie today. Lord, we pray for her healing. We pray, Lord, for uh, the friend of uh, Jennifer's, the, the, the son who has cancer, Lord. And we pray, Lord, for her walk and her efforts, Lord, to help heal and provide hope. Lord, we pray for Caden today for healing and just he'd be able to go home today and thank you for his family. And Lord, for everyone here, Lord, for our expectant moms, Lord, for, for those who are hurting today. Lord, you're mindful and your compassion reaches to each. And we thank you, Lord. And Lord, we just come before you now as one people with grateful hearts, praying the way Christ our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, I'd like to invite you to stand as we prepare to come to the communion table with a hymn, O Come to the Altar. Let's sing together. Are you hurt and broken, broken within? within? Overwhelmed by, by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Behind your regrets, regrets and mistakes, come, come today, today. There's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring, Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a 
the Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, come to the altar, Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Thank you. you. May be seated. Friends, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Do you realize the most true thing about you is your relationship with Jesus Christ? For he created you. He made you, and one day he will call you again to himself, physically present, visibly, that day when faith will become sight. And he gives us this meal now as a remembrance, a memorial, as a real participation in his sufferings on the cross for us. Because on that cross, he took our sins, and he said the most true thing about yourself is that you are loved by the eternal God. And he shared that with us. And then he said, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, this is the Lord's table. This is the place he invites us. And all those who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, who through baptism have repented of their sins and desire to know him and serve him and share with him that gift of life abundant, life eternal. All those are invited to join us today in this table. Please pray with me. Father God, it's really wonderful. It's liberating. It's incredible to know the truth about ourselves is that we belong to you. Lord, because in this world, we're defined so many different kinds of ways, Lord. Defined by our relationships with others, our our jobs, what we do, how successful we are. And Lord, yet all that is passing. The one thing that carries into eternity, the truth about ourselves is who we are in relation to you, Lord. And Jesus answered that question by his own life, death, and resurrection. And so, Lord, fill us with the Holy Spirit today that through worship, through hearing of the word, through singing of songs, prayers, through the sacrament, we may be truly more ourselves, more who Christ has called us to be, and that we may reflect his goodness and his glory each and every day of our lives. And hear those words one day. Well done, good and faithful servant. As we enter the kingdom, Lord, you have graciously prepared for us through his blood. Lord, bless us as we come to this table now. Fill us with your spirit, Lord, and renew us. In Christ we pray. Amen. Friends, can we share what it is we believe together, affirming our faith, using the words of the ancient creed, the Apostles' Creed. Would you stand and join with me? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in a punctuous Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, The third day he rose again from the dead. 
he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, the scripture says that before he was given up to death and raised to life, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. For the scripture tells us that whenever we eat this bread or drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Our Lord Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And as I invite our elders and deacons to come forward to share with us, again, to share with you, our communion bread is gluten-free. Um, as you pass the elements to one another, please share the words, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you, and, and hold the elements, and then we'll all commune together. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. 
Friends, this is the body of Christ given for you. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And the cup of the covenant, the cup of our salvation in Jesus' name. Will you join me now together in the response of God's people found printed in your bulletin? Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Which prayer with me, please? Father God, we thank you, Lord, for Jesus, your Son, our Savior. We thank you for him who gave himself on our behalf, Lord, to just rescue us, to redeem us, to show us, Lord, that we are loved by a love that will never let us go. Lord, we are sinners saved solely by grace. And as we commune together, Lord, with one another, with your spirit, Lord, we pray that a vision of the cross would always be in our heart and our mind that calls us and renews us to follow in the life you've led, Lord, and the life you lead us to. Lord, help us to bring our faith out beyond these walls, into our homes, our workplaces, Lord, into our community, that the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, may be lifted up and praised. In his name we pray and give thanks. Amen. And now as we realize that God has given us this bountiful world around us, filled with beauty and wonder, let us now give back a portion of that bounty as we are directed. If the ushers will please come forward. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, who oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes I am. Free at last he has ransomed me, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who oh, the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Here below, 
and the Heavenly Father. We thank you so much for the abundance we have received, and we thank you for your presence in our lives. Please take the offerings we have given today and bless them to your glory. In Jesus' most holy, unmatched, precious name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Now please remain standing as we sing our closing hymn for today. This is my Father's world. This is my Father's world And to my listening ears All nature sings and round me rings The music of the spheres this is my father's world. I rest me in the front of rocks and trees, of skies and seas. There are no wonders, but this is my father's world. The birds their carol sings. The morning light, the lily white. Let our Maker's praise. This is my Father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass, I hear Him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my Father's world. All that we never forget. Seems half so strong, is our ruler yet. This is my father's word, the battle is not done. Jesus, who died, shall be satisfied, and earth and heaven be one. What beautiful words, friends. I invite you when you leave this place, when you step out either those doors or those doors. And you look around at the beauty, remind yourself, this is your father's world, your father. And he has given you his son, Jesus Christ, that not only this world, but life to come would be yours as well. And now, friends, may the grace and peace of God our Father be with you, the joy and salvation of Jesus Christ around you, and the blessing of the Holy Spirit keep you today and forevermore in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
right. <laughs>